When I was a child, one of my favorite TV shows was Father Knows Best. Who does not know this show? Raise your hand. Bunch of kids, you bunch of kids. Father Knows Best. Nice looking family, huh? It was a simple format that showed a mom and a dad with three kids going through the usual things that families do, but focusing in on the father who would usually end up solving everybody's problem and all within 30 minutes. 30 minutes, boy, every week he had the thing down, right? I mean, it wasn't very realistic, but its virtue was that it erred on the side of idealism rather than pessimism. You know, I was, uh, I was a little kid watching this show and I lived in a, you know apartment building on the second floor with no yard and no front yard, and no backyard, just a balcony. My mom worked, my dad worked. And I watched this show and I wanted to be in that family where the mom was home, where the dad came home at a regular time, where there were no cops showing up each week for their payoffs. <laughs> I wanted to be in that family. So I remember watching it every week. Now, in this show, the dad worked. He was faithful to his wife. He loved and he respected his children. And he always tried to do and help his family do the right thing. What was the right thing? Unlike today, where most TV dads are alone, they're not more mature than their children. They have trouble solving their own problems, let alone give direction to their children. So as a kid, you know, growing up, as I said, eventually without a dad, living in a small apartment, no brothers, no sisters, spending most of my time alone watching TV. I like the idea of a father who is like Robert Young, who played the dad in Father Knows Best. Even if it wasn't real, I wanted it to be real. I wanted dads to be like that dad. What I didn't realize was that the appeal of this program was that it portrayed fathers according to the ideal of fatherhood, the model that worked best, the one that God had designed for all men to strive for. Whether the fathers in this world lived up to the ideal or not, this show at least demonstrated how important father was and what life could be like when fathers knew best. Life was like that when fathers knew best. You know, several years ago, there was an effort to remove every reference to God as a male in the Bible, remember that? The argument was that God is a spirit and could as well be represented by a female and female words and images as had been done by male references. Of course, what this effort at political correctness did not understand was that the referencing of God as father wasn't something that men had projected onto God in order to serve themselves. It was a term that God selected in order to reveal three things about what it meant to be a man, 
to be a father? First of all, it was about position. God as father was about position. The word for father in the Hebrew is ab. It is the first word in the Hebrew dictionary of the Bible. It meant chief or principal, not principal, L-E, principal, like the principal of a school, okay? The first time it appears is in Genesis 2.24, where God says that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. He uses the word ab. God chose this term to describe the male in the marriage relationship. Note that this term was chosen before sin entered the world. And so the idea of father as chief or head is the original concept established with the very first family unit. It's not Adam that invented this. It's God that invented this. It's God that established this and gave it to mankind. Throughout the Old Testament, we see the term father used not only to refer to the male individual in the marriage relationship and family, but also as synonymous term to designate the position of leadership for cultural identity, like Abraham, for example, or nations like the Israelites, even priests and prophets we read about in Judges 17.10 and 2 Kings 6, uh, verse 21. You know, I have a book in my library entitled The Inevitability of Patriarchy. And the idea suggested by this is that because men were stronger, they took charge and made themselves leaders and they developed the male dominated institutions of family and nations and so on and so forth. This is a you know, PC ideology here. Of course, this view works if you believe in the evolutionary model of history, which we don't. What is it that we believe? We believe that God created the world and humanity and that it is God who established the norms and the positions that each one fulfills in this world, both male and female. The positions were not invented by men, human beings. The roles were not figured out by Adam or others. All of these things were created by God and given to human beings. The idea is certainly confirmed by Jesus and his apostles who were extremely condemning towards men who had abused their roles through the mistreatment of women and the family. Jesus rebuked men uh, uh, for their uh, uh, straying from the ideals of faithfulness and love and marriage. Uh, but even though they failed, notice that he didn't change the position that they were given as a trust by God in the home and in the church. There have been a lot of lousy husbands. There have been a lot of lousy elders, a lot of lousy deacons, a lot of terrible preachers, you know, but God didn't change the system because of that. God didn't say, you know what? I don't like this, you know, fathers being the leaders of the family because they've made such a mess of it. You know, we're going to change all of this around. We're going to make the children in charge. Yeah. No, no, God has maintained the very same roles, the very same responsibilities from the very beginning. And each generation is responsible to fulfill those roles as best they can, according to God's ideals, not man's ideals. In the New Testament, Paul clarifies and confirms God's original ideal for man's position within the family as husband and father. In 1 
Corinthians chapter 11, verse three, he says, the man is the head of the woman. That's a spiritual thing. That's an eternal thing. That doesn't change with culture. It doesn't change with political legislation. And then in Ephesians 5.22, he says, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. Again, it's a biblical thing. Some people don't like it. Some people, you know, war against this idea. Some people are angry at men in general because of this. And the answer is, don't be mad at me. Be mad at God. He's the one that placed this burden on men to lead. Because many times the failure in society is the failure that men have of leading. In other words, they don't do the job that God gave them to do, or they don't do it in the way he's taught them to do it. That's the problem. A male dominated society has not grabbed the power away from weaker women and children. That, that, that's history from a women's lib perspective. God has created both man and woman and has given to man the position of leadership in the family. This original position grew to include leadership in tribes and nations. Man has disobeyed God and he's abused this position, but God has not changed the original position that man was required to fulfill. So the term father as given by God means among other things, leader. So to be a father means to lead. It also refers to a man's responsibility. In the New Testament, the writers confirm the original role of leadership for fathers, but they add an additional dimension. This is reflected in the word used in the Greek for father, pater, which means nourisher, provider. The traditional idea has been that man provided income and women provided home care. Today, this is no longer true with over 65% of married women working outside of the home. Now the New Testament doesn't say anything about the earning of income being strictly a man's responsibility. As a matter of fact, the only scripture that deals with the need to provide for family is addressed in a generic sense, and that's in 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, where the command is that anyone who is responsible for a family needs to take care of it, whether you are a male or a female. If you're responsible for a family, you need to be taking care of your family. This is not to say that the New Testament doesn't say that a, that a father doesn't have certain responsibilities, just that earning money is not the only responsibility or the exclusive responsibility. Unfortunately, many men think so long as they bring home a paycheck, my job is done. You, know, you haven't told me you loved me in 12 years. Yeah, but I brought home a paycheck. According to the New Testament, fathers are also to love their wives. It says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Of course, this would include taking care of them, but not just physically, it includes emotional care and spiritual care as well. It's interesting to note that in the Bible, God never lays this responsibility on the wife. There's never the responsibility laid on the wife to nourish the husband's emotional needs. It's as if God knew that she knew how to do this, that this would just come naturally to her because of the way she was designed. 
He puts that responsibility onto men. Why? Because men had to learn this because it didn't come naturally for men to nourish, to care, to support. And other things that fathers are to do according to the Bible. They're to train their children. In Ephesians chapter six, verse four, Paul says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Again, never in the Bible do you see this responsibility given to the mothers. It's always the fathers that are responsible uh, for bringing up the children in the discipline and instruction uh, of the Lord. What's amazing is that in my experience as a minister, it's always been the women who lead in bringing the children and the grandchildren to church, to Sunday school, to VBS. I rarely see a dad by himself dragging a bunch of kids to VBS. It's always mom that's dragging all the kids uh, to, to, to VBS. Many times it's mom uh, who's by herself who works for a living outside the home and then at night also brings her children uh, to VBS and other matters. Fathers are the only ones, however, in the New Testament who are specifically given the responsibility to train their children in spiritual matters. Isn't it interesting that in most cases, as I, as I mentioned, it's the mothers who teach, who go to Sunday school, who promote spiritual things in the, in the home. And here's the most surprising one. Fathers are supposed to manage their homes. First Timothy chapter three, verse four, Paul says he, meaning the dad, must be one who manages his, home, his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. This is a qualification, by the way, for an individual, for a man who seeks to serve as an elder in the church. What do you want to know about him? How well does he manage his household? How well does he keep his children under control? With all dignity means no drama, no drama. You know those fathers, <laughs> those fathers who just raise an eyebrow and you're quiet? <laughs> those fathers who don't have to scream and yell and do all kinds of drama to get your attention? You know when dad goes, hey, and all of a sudden there's silence. <laughs> Elders and deacons must prove that they have achieved this basic duty. This is not a responsibility reserved only for elders and deacons. All fathers have to manage the home well. And if you want to be an elder and deacon, you must prove that you've accomplished this basic task that all fathers have. When it comes to managing the home, we have two false ideas. One, if the man is the sole wage earner, managing the home is the woman's job. That's one of the fallacies that kind of you know, circulates in our society. If I earn the money, if I go out and earn the money, then, and you stay home, the wife, then your job is to manage the household, manage the expectations, manage the future, manage everything that goes on. Because when I get home, all I want to do is flop. Now I can say with confidence, that's an idea that men made up. I'm fairly certain that God did not make up that idea. The other false idea is that if the wife works, then managing the home is a shared responsibility. But the Bible says that managing the household is the man's responsibility. 
The housework, sure, that can be shared. The income can be shared, but the responsibility for making sure that the household operates properly according to God's purpose belongs to the father. And you know what? He'll be judged for it. You know, the great, the great strain in many relationships is caused by fathers who want the position without the responsibility. In other words, men who want to be the boss, but they refuse to take on the responsibility of loving their wife, training their children, and managing their home. They think that if they bring home a paycheck, that earns them the right to be called the boss. And after 40 years of ministry and counseling, I guarantee you that that is not the way to have a happy marriage. I guarantee you that that's not the way. I can refer you to the people that I have spoken to in four decades who have crashed their marriages on the rocks who have that kind of attitude. The way to gain the rightful position described by the Old Testament word for father, which is leader or chief, is to take on the responsibilities described by the New Testament word for father, which is nourisher, provider. That's what the father is, nourisher and provider. These are, these are softer skills than simply earning a living. And I'm not downing earning a living. Let's face it, it's hard to get up every morning and go out and earn a living. But this is not what constitutes being a father. The final thing we learn uh, from the father concept is relationship. The Jews in the Old Testament did not refer to God as their father very often. Believe it or not, only 15 times in the entire Old Testament did some prophet or Jewish person refer to God as father. This may have been because the pagan religions around, uh, around the Jews at the time taught that their people uh, were the biological or mythical sons of the gods. And so the Jews were reluctant to uh, you know, call God their father because it was such a pagan thing. But in the New Testament, Jesus added another dimension to the concept of father that helps us round out our image of man as father. And that is the intimate father the intimate father. Until Jesus, no one had ever used the term Abba in referring to God. The more formal father or chief or leader was sometimes used to describe God as father. Jesus not only personified this by beginning to say my father and your father, as a way of drawing a circle around the disciples and himself and God. He also pushed the imagery to a more intimate level by calling God Abba, Mark 14, 36. And as we know, the term Abba was what a child calls his father. He called, you know, little children don't call their father father, they call him dad or daddy. Well, that's what the term Abba means. It means daddy. Jesus showed that at the heart, the relationship with father is not just one of teacher or leader or provider or protector, but also that of tender and loving and trusting intimacy that exists between a small child and his or her dad. You know, they should have never called it Father's Day. They should have called it daddy's day. Would have made more sense to call it daddy's day. Sometimes dads, when words fail and discipline fails and bribes fail, perhaps what is needed is that 
you become daddy again, no matter how old your child is. When Jesus was in the garden at his worst moment of suffering, he didn't want to discuss the theology of the cross with God, with his father, or the good that it might do. No, he cried out, Daddy, I need you. Becoming a father doesn't just mean producing children. You know, they can do that in a lab nowadays. Becoming a father is a gift given to a man. And it is embodied in the birth of a child and it is expressed by accepting the position of loving and sacrificial leadership of that mother and that child. You become a father and you say, I'm ready to lay my life down for this woman and for the children that she gives me. It also means accepting the responsibilities of loving that mother and training those children and managing that home that you will live in all together. And it also means opening yourself up to a new kind of relationship, a new intimacy, a new vulnerability that you never had before. You see, when you have a child, you can be hurt in ways that no one could ever hurt you before. Your son and your daughter can hurt you much worse than any other person could ever hurt you. And so today is Father's Day and we celebrate not those who just made babies, but those men who made a difference in those babies' lives by providing love and leadership to those children and to those, to those mothers. I read a proverb here, Proverb 23, 24. The father of the righteous will greatly re rejoice and he who has a wise son will be glad in him. And I know that every single father here knows exactly what Solomon meant by this verse. You see, mothers and fathers want different things for their sons and daughters. Mothers want their children to be happy and safe. Fathers want their children to be strong and settled. Note that the father in Solomon's proverb wants his son to be wise the ability to apply knowledge successfully in order to obtain success and peace. Another thing I've noticed is that mothers pray for their children, but fathers wait for their children. They wait until the day that they are convinced that their sons and daughters can stand up by themselves. It's as if they cannot be free to give in to old age or death until they know in their hearts that their children can not only face life and its challenges on their own, but are also able to now be good fathers to their own children and begin the ministry of waiting for the next generation to stand up for and by themselves. Note, in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, that the father was still in the waiting mode. Have you ever thought about that? He was waiting, but did you not realize he was waiting to begin the process of grieving? He didn't know what had happened to his son. As far as he was concerned, his son was dead. He was waiting for confirmation that that death finally took place so he could begin to grieve. And I suspect that his great joy when he saw his boy was powered to a large extent by his surprise 
and relief at not only the return of his lost son, but his return as a man now ready to stand on his own and face the consequences of his bad decisions. The father's waiting was over in more than one way. And yet in the exchange with his eldest son, who was resentful and jealous of his younger brother being happily received back, we see that the father still had some waiting to do concerning his first son, because this is what fathers do. We wait. I tell all fathers and mothers to never stop praying and never stop waiting and hoping for your prodigal child's return because with God, all things are possible for those who believe and I say, for those who wait. Who do you identify with in the story of the prodigal? Do you identify with the father who waits or perhaps the prodigal who needs to come home? Or do you identify with the elder brother that needs to grow up? Regardless of who you identify with, how can we minister to you today? Do you need prayer for you as a father to help you wait patiently for your child to return to? to uh, return to you or to return to common sense or to return to the Lord? Or do you need pro a prayer uh, to be a better father, a better dad? Or do you need help as a prodigal son or daughter to return to being the person you were raised to be and or the person you were called to be by God and taking the first step of that return journey through restoration and baptism. Encouragement and prayer to enable you to be the father that you, your earthly and heavenly father are waiting for you to become is here for you this morning. You see, sometimes God is the one who is waiting on us. I encourage you this morning to not let him wait any longer. Whatever your need, we encourage you to come now and come to the Heavenly Father as well as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.